are the essential ingredient in our lives. Without you, we can do nothing. Thank you, Yeshua, 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 Mashiach.
handed over that authority that he had from God to Satan. You with me? That's why when Satan tempted Jesus, one of the things he said to Jesus is, Bow and worship me. And all these kingdoms, all these things I will give you for they were given to me. You see, it was never his. It was intended for man. But Adam, through his selfishness, gave it, handed it over. Hence we find all of humanity have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned, for have fallen short of the glory of God. You with me? Now, if by the trespass of the one Adam, death reigned through the one Adam, much more surely will those who receive Much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in eternal life through the one Jesus Christ. Amen. I like that. I like that. You see, you have received, you have received his grace. You have received his righteousness. And having received his grace and his righteousness means that you are better off than you ever were. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. You with me? He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Or, that's why in this life that you now live as a believer in Jesus Christ, you cannot look back at your past because that man is dead. That man is buried. That man is in the tomb. And now it is no longer you, but it is Christ who lives in you. Hallelujah. Meaning that in Adam all fall, but in Christ all rise. In Adam all fall, in Christ all rise. You are in Christ, therefore you are risen together with him and you've been made to sit in heavenly places far above all principality. Talk to me somebody. You see, Adam you see, Adam caused the fall. He caused all humanity to fall to the curse. That's what Adam did. Through his act, through his disobedience, he caused all humanity to fall to the curse. Hence we find there is sin, there is sickness, there is disease, Come and talk to me, somebody. There's poverty. All these things that humanity is experiencing is because of the curse. Yeah. But Jesus Christ came and took the curse upon himself. He took that curse upon himself. You with me? He took it upon himself and he died. By dying for us. We were dead. The wages of sin is death. We are all deserving of death. But Jesus Christ, the one who knew no sin, became sin for us. In other words, he became what you formerly were. The day you receive him as your Lord and Savior, you identify that whatever you were is upon him, upon the cross. And now you receive his righteousness. You made righteousness by his obedience. Oh, Jesus. 
So Adam caused all to fall to the curse, but Christ caused all who receive to rise far above the curse to bless him. Yeah. You see, you have risen far, say this with me, I have risen far above the curse. To the blessing. The blessing sets me over. This blessing you cannot measure. It is immeasurable. It is immeasurable. You are far above the curse. That means no demon in hell, no devil can curse you. Come and talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. You are the blessed of the Lord. Say, I am the blessed of the Lord. You are blessed in your coming in. You are blessed in your going out. Come and talk to me, somebody. You are blessed. He has caused you to rise far above the curse. He's caused you, listen, if you were sick, he's caused you to rise above that diagnosis. You may say, yeah, but you know, a whole biological family, they all have, you know, they all have this ailment, they all have this diagnosis. Listen, the prognosis for you is Jesus paid it for you at Calvary's cross. Therefore, you do not have it. It's not a part of you. You are part of another genetic line. Talk to me, somebody. It is the genetic line of Christ. You are of the second Adam. You are of the Christ. In the Message Bible it says, if one man's sin puts crowds of people at the dead end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured through one man Jesus Christ will do. God poured it through the one man Jesus Christ. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing. Can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes? Absolute life in those who grasp, and watch this here, in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift. Let me give an example, probably you can identify this with the woman who came to anoint Jesus, the woman with the alabaster box. The one whom the disciples murmured among themselves, what's this waste? We could have sold this. Somebody buys you an expensive perfume and you know the price of this perfume. And you know, never in your life will you buy it for yourself. <laughs> Come and talk to me, somebody. Now you get them full. When they look at that thing and they, ooh, this is expensive. So when they use it, they use it sparingly. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only one. <laughs> and having done just that one. They hope someone will smell them when they walk in. And if nobody's looking, they get home and it's... Tss, tss. <laughs> now you're hoping somebody smells. And they still can't smell you. Then it's... Tss, tss, tss. Now you find out all of a sudden now people can smell you. Then you know that's how much I'm going to use now. <laughs> but the Bible says here, Imagine the breath taking. This thing will take your breath away. That's all he's saying. This life will take your breath away. If God had to really show you what he has in store for you, it will take the life out of you. In other words, you would faint. Because it would be so much that you can't believe it. Hence you find God gives you in small glimpses. Gives you in small pictures. Are you with me? He says, imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes. Absolute life. In those watch, those who come. You see, it's not everybody. It's not everybody. He says, in those who grasp with both hands. I'm not just going to grasp. You with me? 
If something is given to you in abundance, you, you tell me you're going to be generous. No, you're going to, as much as I can, those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift. Wildly extravagant. In other words, he doesn't even consider the cost of it. He gives it to you freely. It cost him his son, but he did not consider the cost of his son. He gave it freely. That's wildly extravagant. Talk to me. So it's like someone gives you their perfume and they tell you, listen, I got plenty more. You all you need to do is just ask. There's a difference now. In the first scenario, they gave it to you. And that's when you and then but now they tell you when they give it to you, they say, listen, if you like it, there's plenty more where this comes from. You tell me, when you put that perfume on, how are you going to spray it this time? This time you're going to bath in it. Talk to me. You're going to bath in it. You're going to have a... People will people even say, Ooh, did you have a bath in that perfume? This time you're going to bath in it. Why? Because there's plenty more where it comes from. That means there's so much more life that God has for you. That means it doesn't matter what's coming your way. God has got something better, so much better. It doesn't matter what you may be facing, but God has got something better. Yeah. Hallelujah. He says, those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life, this grand, watch that, this grand setting everything right. In other words, setting the record straight. that the one man, Jesus Christ, provides. Jesus provides. The difference between Adam and Jesus, Adam took, was selfish, was dishonorable, was disobedient. Jesus provides. In other words, it's a selfless act made himself of no reputation, was not considered about, Adam was concerned about his reputation because between him and Eve, it was, we will be like God to know good and evil. But Jesus, the Son of God, who, are, come on, who is the form of God, he is God, considered himself of no reputation but taking on the likeness of sinful flesh, he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient even unto death. That's a selfless act. It was something that he did to honor the Father. A true son brings honor to his father. A true son brings honor to his father. A true son obeys his father. And that we see in Jesus. When you look at the contrast, Adam and Jesus. Adam, disobedient. And you find we all, we all, we all were born into that nature, that nature of disobedience. That nature where you will consider everything to be right as long as it seems right in your own eyes, but you do not take thought or you do not rather consider whether or not it is right in the sight of the Father. You see, Jesus, the life of Jesus was a life of absolute obedience and trust in the Father. That whatever the Father calls me to do, I do it. Yeah. That is Jesus. Whatever the Father expects of me, I do it. I fulfill it. Talk to me, somebody. Adam 
that Adamic nature is corruptible. It grows corrupt. It decays. But the nature of Christ is incorruptible. It is incorruptible. It does not decay. It lives forever. Talk to me, somebody. The Passion Translation says this. It says, now there is no comparison. Oh, I like this. There is no comparison. Tell your neighbor, there is no comparison. There is no comparison. In other words, you cannot compare the two. You see, if you're saying there is no comparison, it means you cannot compare the two. There is no comparison between Adam's transgression and the gracious gift that we experience. You cannot compare the two. Through the disobedience and through what you actually experience. Being born again is an experience. It's an experience. Because you experience God. You experience Christ. Being born again, it is not an event. It is an experience. It's a life-changing experience. Because once you, once you experience it, once you experience it, you just know that something happened in my spirit when I was born again. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are born again by the Spirit of God. That means, listen, to be born again means you have a new life. That's what born again means. It means you've been born, yes, before, but now you're born again. You are born into sin, but now you are born into righteousness. So you cannot compare the two. That's why you cannot live your life based upon your past. You cannot compare it. Because where you are now, you are in a better position with God. You are in a better position in life. Where before you were the underdog, you're now the top dog. Yeah. Talk to me. Hallelujah. Where you were previously the tail, you're now the head. Where you were previously below and disadvantaged, you're now advantaged and above. There's no comparison between Adam's transgression and the gracious, okay, the gracious gift that we experience. For the magnitude, wow, the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. Mm. The magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. It far outweighs it. Mm. Jesus. You see, before on the scales of justice, you were, because of the crime, you were disadvantaged. You with me? But if I take something that is heavier than the crime, and I place it on the opposite side, what do you think would happen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Hallelujah. Brother Lucy, please, would you pass me one of those hankies? Just one. Just one. Thank you. Okay. The crime on the scales of justice brought you down in life. Down and out. Cannot help yourself. But now the gift comes. And this is what the gift does. Where is it now? You are no longer, come on, talk to me, somebody. That is no more part of your life. On the scales of justice, it ceases to exist. It is no more. Talk to me, somebody. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's now, listen, the, the, the scales are now balanced. The magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. It's true that many died because of one man's transgression, but how much greater will God's grace 
time his gracious gift of acceptance. Wow. God's gift. God's grace. And his gracious gift of acceptance. Overflow to many because of what one man, Jesus, the Messiah, did for us. God's gracious gift of acceptance. You may feel and think that, oh, I'm not worthy enough. Oh, I don't deserve it. That is grace. It's unmerited favor. You do not earn it. He gives it to you freely. And now he says, you are now acceptable to me. Because you accept my son. You accept what my son has done for you. Hence, my son makes you a part of this royal family. My son brings you into this royal priesthood. Hallelujah. How much greater will God's grace and his gracious gift of acceptance overflow? Tell somebody, it is overflowing in my life. Because of what Christ done for me. Hallelujah. Goes on in verse 17 to say, Death once held us in its grip. That means it was once upon a time, once held us in its grip. And by the blunder of one man, death reigned as king over humanity. But now, somebody say, But now, how much more are we held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings in life, enjoying our legal freedom through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus, the Messiah. You see, death reigned as a king, but now we have Receive, we have a hold on this grip, and grace has its hold on you. It has its grip on you. And because of that, now you reign as a king in this life. You reign over death. In other words, you are not afraid to die. Come and talk to me, somebody, because you know you are alive. You are alive. Your spirit is alive. You are alive. Talk to me, somebody. You know that the real you in this body is the spirit that is in this body. And you know that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So it doesn't matter what comes your way. Whether you live, whether you die, you are the Lord. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. The Adamic nature is a fallen, incomplete nature. A nature separated from God. It is a nature that is powerless. It is a nature that is helpless. It is a, na it is a nature that is vulnerable. Yeah. It is a degenerated, you see, degenerated nature. It is a sick nature. It is a sick nature. And that word sick, I'm using it twofold. One for, yes, it is sick. In the sense of a physical sickness, of a spiritual sickness. And it's also sick in the sense that, when you, you go with me quickly, Ezekiel 36. Hallelujah. Say, I'm receiving something today. Ezekiel 36, verse number 31. I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you an inhabited, I will make you inhabited as in former years, and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. That's verse 11 of Ezekiel 36. Hallelujah. Now verse 31 says this. Then you will remember. Watch. Then you see, once you become born again, you, you get taken from an unfruitful state to a fruitful state. 
You start bearing fruit. God now multiplies you. He multiplies you. Talk to me. He multiplies you. And when you consider what God has just done, verse 31 says, you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. That's why many of us, when we look at our past, we are disgusted with it. It makes us sick. To think that you were so sick. Are you getting what I'm saying now? That's that nature. It's a sick nature. Because when you look around you and you think, ah, oh, you know, what people are doing makes me sick. It's not the people that are sick. It's the spirit that's operating in the people. Yeah. That's why you're not fighting the people. You're fighting the spirit behind them. That makes you sick. You know, many people say, hey, it's sickening to think that people can be that way. Mm -hmm. huh? It's sickening to think that people can do that. It's sickening to think that people can speak like that. It's sickening to think that people can behave that way. Why? Because there is another power in operation in them. It's a spirit of disobedience. And we too were once children of disobedience. But now, through through Christ, in Christ, we become obedient children, obedient to his voice, obedient to his word, obedient to his spirit, obedient to him. Hallelujah. That's the Adamic nature. But now in Christ, we were called. In Christ, we were called we were purposed, we were ordained, and we were destined to live, talk, and function in this life in Christ. Yeah. That's God's plan. Hallelujah. That's God's plan. It's for us all to talk, to walk, to talk, and live. And function in Christ. You are meant to function in Christ. Say that. I was meant to function in Christ. When you look at the definition of Christ, the name Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. The anointed one and his anointing. He is the river of life, the fountain of life, the spring of life, the waters of salvation. You know, if you watch documentaries like National Geographic and the BBC, and you watch how, um, you know, a predator will be preying on something. For instance, a lion would be chasing a wildebeest, and that wildebeest will run and the lion will follow its scent. But once the wildebeest gets into the water, the scent is lost. The scent is lost. It gets into the water and it runs across it. If you watch with the buffaloes, they run across the water because the scent is lost. And the predator now can no longer pursue them. Israel coming out of Egypt, getting to the Red Sea, crossing the Red Sea, the waters of the Red Sea closed. The enemy cannot smell them anymore. The enemy cannot touch them anymore. The enemy cannot rule over them anymore. Come and talk to me. That was symbolic of the waters of baptism. It was a foreshadow of what was to come. That now you have crossed from the old to the new. Yeah. Hmm. Hallelujah. You are meant to live in the anointed one and his anointing. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27 tells us, The anointing lifts the burden and destroys the yoke. The anointing lifts burdens and destroys yokes. And that is what you have, son. 
somebody. Talk to me. You receive Jesus Christ, the anointed one, and his anointing. You received him. You receive the anointed one. You receive, because you receive the anointed one, you have his anointing. Talk to me. Anointing is the presence of God upon an individual. Acts 10 verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about healing the sick and doing good and delivering all those who were tormented of the devil for God was with him. When the anointing is upon you, it means that God is with you. It means that God is for you. The anointing empowers you and enables you to do that which is humanly speaking impossible to a natural man. The anointing brings you to a place of the supernatural. Hence you find you have a supernatural life. Amen. Hallelujah. Watch yet. Isaiah 10 verse 27 from the Message Bible it says this. I God of the angel armies will go after them with the cat of nine tails and finish them off decisively as Gideon downed Midian at the rock Oreb. Watch it. Gideon downed Midian. One man downed a nation at the rock Oreb. As Moses, watch, as Moses turned the tables on Egypt, on that day, Assyria will be pulled off your back and the yoke of slavery lifted from your neck. That means the anointing empowers you to lay down things that had a power over you. They come and talk to me. It enables you to lay down things that had a power over you. The anointing enables you to turn the tables. Yeah. You, are you getting what I'm saying? To turn the tables. To turn the tables. To cause things that were not working, the things that were working to your disadvantage, to turn the tables and cause them to work to your advantage and to your good and to your benefit. Because listen, talk to me somebody. The Bible says that gift, the grace of God and the gift of God's grace overflows to the benefit of the many who receive Jesus. Hallelujah. Tell somebody I'm living a life with benefits. Hallelujah. I'm going to turn the tables. Mm -hmm. It's on dry. Hallelujah. John's Gospel, chapter number 15, verse 7, says this. But if, there's that word again, if, if you live in union with me, this is Jesus speaking, if you live in union with me, if you are united with me, and if, again, if, if you are united with me, and if my words live powerfully within you, if my words live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire and it will be done. See that? So if you live in union with him, if you are united with him, and his words live powerfully in you, when his words live powerfully in you, then you will ask what you will, whatever you desire, and it will be done. This is the statement I'd like to make. The power of the word in you, the power of the word in you is determined by the measure you believe it to be absolute and true. The power of the word in you is determined by the measure that you believe it to be absolute. In other words, that in the, to the measure that you believe that word to be the final authority and the absolute truth. You see, it's got a, there's a very really powerful thing there. 
and said, yes, you can have the word in you, but do you believe it to be absolute? Do you believe it to be the final authority? Do you believe it to be the final say? Amen. Do you believe it to be the final word? In other words, I'm not going to take another word. Amen. Talk to me, somebody. You're not going to take another word. In other words, someone comes with bad news, I don't listen to bad news because I have the gospel and the gospel means good news. Tell your neighbor, I have good news. I don't know about you, but I have good news. Hallelujah! When Satan comes with his lies to try and give you a lie and give you bad news, you tell him, Satan, thank you very much. That is for you. That is your story. My story is good news. My story is his story. The bad news is not for me. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Jesus. The Amplified says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is, if we are vitally united, and my message abides in your heart. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Ask whatever you wish. In other words, it will be done for you in accordance to what is in your heart. That word that is in your heart ought to be alive. Because when it's alive, it is full of life. Life is flowing. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from deep within his being will flow rivers of living waters. Talk to me. Hallelujah. We all know Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now how, listen, when is God pleased? What pleases God? What pleases God? Faith. Faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. You with me? So, as you work out your faith, you're pleasing Him. And when He's pleased with you, He comes to your aid. He comes to your rescue. He comes to your defense. He comes to your help. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. So as I operate in faith, knowing that the Father has been covered, I trust Him. I believe Him. As I do that, He gives me the desires of my heart. Because how does faith come? By the Word. Faith comes by the Word. And Jesus said, if you remain in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you will and it shall be done. Yes. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Father. How do I do that? By exercising my faith. By taking the word that is in me and bringing it alive. And how do I bring the word alive? By doing what the word says. Talk to me, somebody. As you do that, He gives you the desires of your heart. You ask whatever you will, and it shall be done. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. In other words, listen, Christ is the kingdom. Christ is the righteousness. Christ is your peace. Christ is your joy. Talk to me, somebody. Remember when Jesus spoke to the people in Luke chapter 11, verse 20. He says, if I, with the finger of God, cast out demons and devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Amen. You see, Christ is the kingdom. Amen. Talk to me. He says, I bestow upon you a kingdom just as the Father bestowed one upon me. Jesus is the kingdom. Amen. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the rule of God and the government of God. And Jesus says, if I with the finger cast out demons, cast out devils, know that the kingdom of God 
has come upon you. The rule of God has come upon you. Listen, when the kingdom of God comes, no demon, no devil can stand up against the power of the kingdom. And Jesus says in Luke 17 verse 21, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. It's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy in the Holy Ghost. Talk to me somebody. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my peace. Christ gives me joy. I ask that my joy may be full. I delight myself in Christ. Talk to me. I'm abiding in the anointed one and he's anointing. Oh boy, if you just see it this morning. Somebody say, I am anointed. I am anointed. Oh yeah. Praise God. Amen. In Nehemiah 8 verse 10. I think Sister Dolly or someone mentioned it earlier, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you remember that? The joy of the Lord is your strength. In John chapter 2, in John chapter 2 verse 17, we find, you remember the money lenders when Jesus walked into the temple and he got there and the money lenders were there. What did Jesus do when he got in there? What did he do? He kept silent at the tables. He turned the tables. And he shamed up them out of there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> Jesus. He cleaned the temple. And then his disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house has consumed. Zeal for your house means that you are so delighted in the Father that He consumes you so much that when you see the enemy at work, you throw him out. You see, the money lenders in the temple. It's symbolic of um, Satan, how he runs amok in the lives of humanity, in the lives of mankind, whom God has purposed to be holy and separated unto him, and to serve him in purity. And Satan came to defile it. Now when Jesus comes in, you see, it's, it's symbolic of your life, of my life. We once were trading. We once were doing our own thing. Because we thought it was right. In our minds, oh, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm right, you're wrong. But when the righteousness of God was revealed to us, Jesus came in. He came in. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? When you opened the door and Jesus came in, he chased out the money lenders from your life. Talk to me. You are no longer borrowing. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You're no longer a borrower. You are a lender to many nations. He's turned the tables. You are no longer sick. You are healed. You are no longer in prison. You are set free. You are no longer broken. You are made whole. You are made complete. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Praise God. Christ turned the tables on the enemy. He obliterated him. Talk to me. Watch it. First John chapter 2 verse 27 says this. I want you to highlight this. First John 2 27. Remember this. Meditate on this. He says, as for you, the anointing, the special gift, the preparation The, this thing, this was prepared for you. This gift was prepared for you. Christ is the gift. The anointed one and his anointing was prepared just for you. He says, the anointing, the special gift, the preparation which you received from him remains permanently in you. 
and you have no need for anyone to teach you, but just as his anointing teaches you, giving you an insight through the presence of the Holy Spirit about all things, and it's true, and it's not a lie, and just as his anointing has taught you, you must remain in him. Remain in the anointed one. Remain in the anointed one. Remain in the anointed one and his anointing. In other words, remain in his word. Because it's by, you see, when I'm resting, when I'm remaining in the word, I'm staying in the word, the word is, is anointed. There's an anointing in this word. That's how when you read the word, it imparts faith to you. That word is an anointed word. It imparts faith. Faith is imparted through the anointing. And now when that anointing is living on the inside of you, the anointing prompts you to work out your faith. And when you start working out your faith, you get amazed, you get, you get, come on, talk to me, you get amazed at what God starts doing because you start doing the word. And you see the word at work. Tell your neighbor, the word is working in my life. He says, you must remain in him, being rooted in him, met to him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if Satan ever tries to lie to you, if Satan ever lies to you, hit him with the word. Tell him what the word says that the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for you. That is how you defeat him. Talk to me, somebody. So in other words, when Satan comes with a lie, you tell him, Satan, I have a better word for you. I have a better story for you. This is what the word says. Talk to me. Hallelujah. Come and talk to me, somebody. We are daily growing in this thing. We are daily, listen, we are daily growing in this thing. Not that you have, you never come to a place where you fully apprehend it. Not that I count myself to have apprehended it, but this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me, I reach for, I stretch towards the mark of the upward call of God in Christ. Forgetting the If you miss the mark, don't let the devil come and tell you that it's the end. You tell him this is what the Bible says, 1 John 1 verse 9 tells me, if we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us of all sin. Talk to me, somebody. You see, Satan will come and keep on knocking on your door and trying to give you a court case to bring you into condemnation and bring you into guilt so that he can bury you. No, you give him the word of God. You see, that's what the devil wants. He wants you to feel sorry for yourself so that you can't speak for yourself. Because when you can't speak for yourself, you are vulnerable. But when you start speaking, come on, talk to me. Speak back to the devil. Don't allow Satan to speak to you. You tell him, come on, talk to me. What did Jesus do? He, listen, Jesus got so sick of this thing in front of him. He said, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Get behind me. Now did you tell him, listen, take your story. That's behind me. That's the past. I'm leaving it in the past. I'm forgetting what is in the past. And I'm stretching forth to the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God's plan for me the anointed one and his anointing. Hallelujah. Amen. I like this one. Watch this. The Holy Spirit is your divine encourager. Amen. Whenever you feel down, understand that you have an encourager who is divine. Amen. John 15 verse 7. The passage translation says this. But here's the truth. Here's the truth. This is Jesus speaking. Here's the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. 
For if I don't go away, the divine, watch it, the divine encourager will not be released. I like that. The divine encourager will not be released to you. But after I depart, I will send him to you. First John seven, first John one verse seven says, "If what here? If that word is if. Don't live on the other side of if. Step into it. It says, if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another." And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, that word light, it's a Greek word force. P-H-O-S, force. It means a heavenly light. It means of truth and its knowledge. If we walk in this heavenly light, if we walk in this truth and knowledge. In other words, the revelation of who he is, who he created you to be, and who you have become in him by virtue of the blood, if we do that as he is in the light. Hallelujah. That is where we get the word photo from, from the word light. What is a photo? What is a photo? What's a photo? If I were to ask you, what's a photo? It's a, it's a picture taken by camera. That's the picture, it's a picture, you know, the camera takes the picture. The dictionary defines it as this. A photo is an image created by light. Mm -hmm. A photo is an image created by light falling on a photosensitive surface which has a chemical, electrical or other response to light. Put it this way. You dwell in the light as he's in the light. Therefore, listen, you are sensitive to him. You are sensitive to his voice. You understand when he is speaking. You know that it is his voice. You know that it's him who is speaking. And now you walk in light of that. And as you do that, you become a photo of who he is. You become a photo of who he is, who he created you to be, and who you truly are in him by virtue of the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. That's why Jesus said, Have I been with you so long, Philip, yet you ask me, show us the Father. He who has seen me, that's what he's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. That means if anybody wants to see Christ, if anybody wants to see the anointed one and his anointing at work, they can see you. Yes. You are the photo of the Father, the photo of the Son. Talk to me now. And it's a beautiful photo. When God sees you, he sees the beauty that he has created. Forget about what the world told you, how you look, I don't care, listen, oil of a lay, Revlon, those things are not going to work. Listen, the real you, in you, God sees you 
as his own special creation. God sees you as his most treasured treasure. You are valuable to him. Yeah. You are so valuable to him. You are so important to him. You know, listen, you know, very often, consider this, you know, you know, in our human nature, you find sometimes you even wake up and God will be on your mind. You'll be busy at work, but God will be on your mind. But do you know that 24-7, year in, year out, for all eternity, you are on his mind? You're always on his mind. You are always on his mind. Can you wake up with that thought tomorrow morning? The Father has me on his mind. The Father, you understand? When, once you begin to get that consciousness that the Father has me on his mind, it will be so easy for you to ask him for something, believe him, and you receive it. You will see. I mean, Pastor Sharon shared the testimony of, you know, she received a report. She didn't get the job. And I remember because, you know, I was working in my office at home. And as I was working, she told me about the report. And I was busy because I was busy at work working from home. So as I was busy, I remember hearing the phone ring. And I remember her answering. And then she comes back and tells me, you know what? It was on my heart to go and pray. And just as I was about to pray, the phone rang. And she answered the phone. And there it was very clinic. They got a job for her. Do you understand that? Plan, your plan A will always fail. Because you know what? Plan A, A means alternative. And every time you have a plan, you, you, you always live in plan A. Because that is my alternative to God's best, which is plan B. But plan B will always override plan A. You got that? So though your plan A may fail you, and it will fail you because it's an alternative to what God has. God's plan for you, you cannot run away from it. Look at Jonah. You run away from God's plan. You sink your boat. You sink your boat. But when you can throw yourself into his plan, you always provide. You remember that? The whale came and carried him to shore. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. So in closing, Christ has set us free from the old Adamic nature which is degenerated, decayed, and dead. Christ has set you free from that. Somebody say, in Christ I have become alive unto God. I live as God intended for me to truly live. Christ has positioned me in right standing and right hand fellowship with God, the Father. I am, saved. I am saved. I am healed. I am redeemed. I am delivered. And I'm set free from slavery to sonship. Can you say amen from God Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are not a slave anymore. You are a son. You are a son of the Most High God. You are a child. Most high God, talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Say, I'm a son of the Most High. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You are a beautiful people.
You are a beautiful people. God created you for his beauty, for his glory. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You are living in Christ. You are living in the anointed one and his anointing. I believe that we're in an hour where the anointing will flow from you. Come and talk to me, somebody, and will change things in your life. Hallelujah. 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 My Jesus is not dead. He's alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If somebody wants to know, if, come on, talk to me. If he's alive, all you just say is, look at me. I'm a testimony of what Jesus has done. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind in sun, but now I can see. I once was deaf to the voice of God, but now I can hear. Come on, talk to me. I once was lame, where I couldn't walk in life. I couldn't get up for myself. But now, but now in Christ, I've been raised up from the dead.
Amen. 